special uh, EEG helmets. <laughs> so you don't even have to speak. It just the clock. Yeah, there's uh, <laughs> this is, uh, there's this company you can get it from called uh, Emotive.com. They they have a YouTube video where they show how somebody can play a video game with just some. You get 14 time series continuously, and then you write whatever software you want to, to process that. And uh, yeah, in the future you can just. Instead of giving a talk, I'll just stand up here and just watch my brain waves. <laughs> so I bought one of these. There's uh, 200 rats working on uh, <coughs> turning this into an uh, Epix interface. So that I, I want to be able to align the interferometer with my mind. <laughs> yeah. You laugh now. Wait. Been so many talks now that I'm not even sure what the topic is that I'm talking about. What are we? What's happening here? Uh, keynote. Keynote. Mm -hmm. Something. I like go. Yeah. Don't re review. Don't review. Okay. Um, Uh, the, so the rest of what I'm talking about in this one is just something like uh, uh, the story which goes behind this plot, something like that, which is what happened, why are these things like this, could it have been better, Was it? should we feel bad that it took so long, or should we feel good that it didn't take so long, or what's, what's the sign of, what does this imply about us, us as people? Um, yeah, I don't know. So, um, I think when I generated this, some of these slides the first time, I was several years younger, and it was something like in this, maybe in this time period, and I was feeling the the pain of this this experience. And so, uh, some of the adjectives you maybe see in here are inflammatory or something like that. But so just <laughs> you have to apply the impulse response of s several years of aging. And so if you convert it into my present state, it's much more m mellow than it looks like. Anyway, here's a timeline of what went on. Uh, we had, I, I started with the project sort of over here someplace. Um, and each of these m things, milestones, seemed very impressive to me. Um, we, we did a lot of this engineering run stuff where we would, uh, the interferometer would resonate, but the noise was terrible, and or it would be better. And at at this state, we were still not best in the world. Um, I think uh, around here we were at the top, and I was I was told to I should graduate at this point, and then maybe I it took me this long. I don't know. Uh, anyway, it was a a lot of a lot of pushing to get to this point, and. I won't get into this details. I'm just talking about this period, but uh, we we learned a lot of lessons that helped us in the next few upgrades and is and is making this current round of commissioning much much faster. So they're painful, but not. Uh, uh, I mean, it's a good good pain pain that makes you learn. Um, so these these scales. Th this is the first time this has been attempted. This. Um, low displacement and phase sensitivity at low frequencies. And there's a huge difference in style going from 1 kilohertz to 100 hertz. And we are, n we are now 
a little bit relearning that. Oh, we were ready for it, but I think we were re-feeling that problem and going from 100 hertz to 10 hertz. You do something on the tabletop, y you can have all kinds of fantastic stuff because you control everything. But when you do something with suspended optics and trying to go for low frequencies, it's uh, it's, it's just a different game. When you, you, you go to anyone at any of the observatories and say, oh, I've demonstrated this fancy thing in my laboratory in the basement here, and I'm sure it's going to work for you. It's just some technical work left to integrate it into your system. They just laugh at you, and rightly so. Um, so anyway, these are just some, some firsts. And there's a huge vacuum system, huge optics. This, this had not been tried before. Uh, the, I think the... It's it's often easy because we don't put it into our diagrams to forget the fact that not not just the fact that it's many many servo loops, but that um, they're all real time, high speed, meaning they need you know they're running at tens of kilohertz sample rate, and they have to be low noise. And uh, if you have something like any of the two of those three, it's pretty easy. You can do if you don't have to do real time, it's pretty easy to do low noise with digital control systems because you can just do some oversampling and averaging and these are standard techniques. But to get really to the digitization limit, um, to, to work at the limits of thermal, uh, thermal and quantum limits and to do it real time for so many channels is, is pretty challenging. Um, there have been prototypes before of this power cycle Fabry-Pro Michelson, um, but this LIGO is actually the first, first one that actually worked. The the prototypes didn't actually uh, didn't actually happen. They, people tried all kinds of different modulation schemes, but and to prototype for this, but it didn't really. Um, th this was the first. It, it sort of had to be its own prototype. Um, and then yeah, there's all kinds of social issues, which is have lar having large groups and how do you make them work, and it's very public. Um, but the, uh, the I think the main lesson, which I would I would keep repeating, is that the initial design was made in a way which assumed that the initial design was correct, and uh, for you know like small scale things, if you do locking to one cavity or something, this I think it's all reasonable. You can predict all of the effects. But what was not allowed in this design is that uh, what what will we do if something like several of the systems fail? How w are we ready that we have enough? options, we can press some buttons and some new thing will slide into place. And that, that wasn't the case, which is uh, maybe why it, why it took so long. Um, this is a picture I, has, it, have, has everyone seen this picture before? Yeah, good. Um, okay, so these, this is the parameters of the initial LIGO. Um, uh, 15, why do I say 15 here? Ah, this is the parameters of the enhanced LIGO, which is the small upgrade after the LIGO. Uh, after a 30, we had a 35 watt laser. We could never handle the full power, and around 15 watts got into the system, and that we could handle something like between 40 and 60 kilowatts in the arm cavities. So that's, but otherwise the optics are the same. Um, the we talk about the sites and we show these uh, seismic things, but here are some hidden hidden features of the two sites which change quite a lot the details of working there. Uh, first of all, um, a, lot of, a lot of the workers who can work um, sort of like from noon until 5 a.m., they're all much younger than me. They sort of thir below 30. And the number of those people you get Sometimes depends on the local university situation. Here in Washington, the the big uh, science university is University of Washington. It's four hours driving away through the mountains, and th n none of those grad students were wor working here at the observatory. Um, in Louisiana, we are only thirty to forty-five minutes away from the uh, Louisiana State University, and so as a result, there's several grad students working on the interferometer and the fact that there is already this graduate student community makes it a little bit more friendly for other ones to show up there. And so um, it's the case now if you go here, there's almost no room because of there's so many students and postdocs who are active there. It's, a, it's phenomenal. Uh, anyway, and 
some of these other things, affordability and so on, affect affect uh, the the working life there. Well, this is also a previous generation Rana thing, using animations. Uh, so this is this is usually what we show. Um, this is a the initial design and some calculations went into these traces and it was expected that uh, we could get to this sensitivity and it was sort of sort of a promise I think um, and and here are some some descriptions of why what what goes into these traces um, and and what are the problems um, in order to get this seismic wall to be very low the seismic isolation system was made to be very aggressive at these frequencies and um, it's, I mean, it, you could say it in a mathematical way, uh, um, using this uh, causality uh, condition that Peter described. But uh, b basically, the point is, if you have a lot of a lot of damping in your system, then the isolation performance is sort of ruined at high frequencies because instead of a full isolation from a spring, you're getting some cutoff due to the, this uh, one over f cutoff that I described before from rubber. Uh, these things were made to have not so much damping, and as a result, they they bounce around a lot at low frequencies. I say two hertz here, but also that six hertz mode that you were pointing out before is the it's the same effect. So the seismic isolation system isolates, but it also amplifies. Maybe not so good. Um, I, I, we work quite a long time to be able to produce these kinds of plots, which show. At any given time, we would uh, run some code, and it would measure many, many, many channels, and then say, um, with a, given our model of the system, it would predict it would predict some sensitivity. So here, there's this green dashed thing, which is the predicted sensitivity, and the black messy curve is the actual measured sensitivity, and it lines up pretty well. But this is after long, long amounts of work. And there's and there's still some excess that doesn't really match here at low frequencies, uh, and at the beginning this plot included maybe just three or four traces, and uh, and then didn't match up at all. And one of the I think one of the things we learned uh, is that this type of thing needs to be automated and happen all the time. And uh, you know I learned how to do this by watching what the Tama collaboration was doing. Uh, and they were doing it based using analog spectrum analyzers because they didn't have much of a digital control system. This is also done partially that way. It, it used to take something like two weeks to make one. And by the end of the initial enhanced LIGO time period, it was a kind of automated single button press and the, and the plot would pop up, which, which really is handy. It lets you know what's, what's, what's uh, going on. Um, so what, what was wrong with these? Um, these assumptions uh, that go into this. Um, well, it's true there's seismic isolation, but this neglects the operation of the other things, the vacuum system and the support structure. Those, those are non-isolation systems. They amplify this. Uh, th this is really correct. They amplify the seismic noise by up to a factor of 30 in a large band from 10 to 40 hertz. It's huge, huge amplification, very mysterious. Um, the suspension thermal noise model, which goes into this trace, uh, was was off. It's f squared instead of f to the minus five halves. That worked in our advantage, I think. So this somewhat overestimates the suspension thermal noise. Um, there's this trace, which represents the thermal noise of the mirror itself, but it's missing this key thing, which is uh, what what I talked about before: the thermal noise from the from the coating. Um, and then there's several points here. Um, although, you know, this this looks nice that the theory and the measurement overlap. That there are there are several canceling factors which which make them all overlap. Um, the actual amount of power recycling buildup we got was more than expected. That the optics turned out better than expected, so that was good. Um, so both of these worked to they would s make this noise smaller. Uh, but then we found that um, the fields that we're using for doing the uh, Pound-Driever-Hall detection for the gravity wave readout, they didn't overlap. Uh, the RF sidebands that we generated have a different shape than the uh, 
carrier light which has the gravity wave signal on it. And um, not only did they not overlap, we didn't even know, we just didn't know this for a long time. And this was due to some uh, uh, cho choice of optics which made the, uh, the beam shape very distorted. Um, the importance of seismic noise became clear as time went on. Uh, this is one of the sites, the Hanford Washington site. It's pretty quiet in this band. It's RMS motion is a few nanometers. And the Louisiana site is, you know, sometimes 10 to 30 times noisier. And wh what does this matter? You know, we're doing our detection up here and this is going on down here. Well, it's, it's as, as I said before, there's uh, nonlinearities which come into the system. Um, this is the ground motion. And so the, the true terribleness of this is that the stack which the system was sitting on was amplifying this noise by another factor of 10 or so. So the true motion that was seen by the interferometer was quite a lot. It was close to the, it, it was so high that uh, big changes had to be made in the hardware and the servo design to compensate these. Uh, I, I, I could go on and on forever. Uh, you mean uh, scientifically or you mean seismically? Seismically. Because uh, it's very interesting question. Otherwise, why would they close? Uh, yeah. You mean what's happening here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. So, in this band, in the, so in the future, where this doesn't matter, where we're using active isolation, the high frequency motion at Livingston <laughs> is less than in Hanford. And so it could be that if we are limited by this Newtonian gravity noise, then the Louisiana site will be better at the end, just because that's better. Maybe but the, the slushy land? Uh, yeah, but it, it also could be we find out that the reason we can't do this attraction very well is that uh, it's difficult to it's, it's difficult to measure the motion of slushy land, and hard rock would be easier because there's more coherence. But that's a uh, the, these details of the difference between mud and non are we're trying to model, but we're not sure about the answer. But without subtraction, certainly the Louisiana site would be better in the it's, Whenever I say uh, due to the low seismic noise in Louisiana, understands what I'm talking about. It's a good idea. is off. Okay. I can't use both. Not advisable. Okay. I should turn this off. Um, yeah, okay. So th there's many things like this and I uh, these these are the the biggest changes that had to be done in order to get it to work. So I mean, uh, you can look at the previous plots and say, oh, how remarkable that is that the detector performance noise, you know, the noise performance of the detector was exactly, you know, within square root of two as predicted by the initial design. Yeah, it was after all of these things were implemented. So if you subtract all of them. You don't even want to know what things would look like. They would be. Uh, <coughs> yes, we would be here in this. You notice this is a rainbow. It goes from hot to cold here, and we would be somewhere in the green region without those things. It would it would not be good. And oh, oh, so I don't like animations. Um, right. Uh, I, I think I have it somewhere, but this this only includes upgrades post two thousand or something. The pre like prehistory of stuff uh, I didn't include. Yeah, those are terrible. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's a constant reprediction, but uh, no, no, no. I mean, but we can more things like this until we met the initial prediction. That was the feedback mechanism, I think. 
uh, what is all this stuff? Um, in, initially, the way that we did the feedback on the suspended system was through analog circuitry. And that, if that doesn't horrify you, then you don't know what, what it means. It, the, it means that we had things like, we had circuits that were big boxes like this filled with things like a 10th order Chebyshev low pass filter that someone had made by hand and that we were clicking on and off. And uh, in order to balance uh, the gain between certain channels, we would move a slider and a control screen and a voltage would go to a thing and then a variable potentiometer would move around and it was a, it's hard to even imagine in, in modern times. Um, this hydraulic isolator was not part of the initial design, it was being trying, uh, uh, developed for advanced LIGO and then when we saw that Louisiana just couldn't operate in the daytime, it was emergency rushed to be put in. Um, the initial electronics had a huge sensitivity to uh, those problems. We were using switching supplies. We had a lot of sensitivity to 60 hertz, and there were crosstalk between channels. Connectors were not good. And so a pretty extensive retrofit was done in Louisiana, and, but then never copied for Hanford. Um, these suspension ele electronics, even after going digital, there's still some analog stuff between your digital to analog converter and your mechanics. And that had to be changed many, many, many times. And the reason that was so challenging is that we were trying to handle the full dynamic range, meaning, you know, one micron at low frequencies and 10 to the minus 19 meters at high frequencies in a single stage of electronics, which is, uh, I don't know, it's, you, it's something you would do if someone dared you to do it, maybe. But it's one of the key advantages of the multi-stage multi suspension design is that at each stage, the displacement noise is reduced, and so the electronics, uh, the dynamic range of the electronics required at each stage is much, much less than before. It's a much easier job. Um, and then the uh, detection, photo detectors were changed quite a bit. Uh, another thing that we didn't realize, or I think some people realized, but not the extent of how it was going to happen, is that uh, all of the beams from the interferometer would come out onto tables just like this, and there would be a box on the table. But uh, we were still sensitive to the uh, just acoustics in a laboratory environment. And if you're trying to detect 10 to the minus 10 radians of uh, phase interferometrically, you can't allow for any of the field to, you know, to think about it, think about it. 10 to the minus 10 radians it's a, it's a part in 10 to the 10 of field, which means it's a part in 10 to the 20 of power. It's unimaginable. You know, there's no, there's no clean optics anywhere you can make which will uh, scatter less than a part in 20 back in. So you, you just can't allow it. You have, to, you, have to have all, you have to isolate it from moving. You have to have super clean surfaces. All of the extra little third and fourth order beams have to be dumped into super black surfaces. It's a huge... It's it's like that story of the little boy in the dam. You, you go, you plug this thing, you plug this thing, another spout comes out, and uh, there are weeks and weeks I remember every day from as soon as I woke up to until I was exhausted. All that I was doing was walking around and kind of cleaning a little optic and tilting this little thing, come back in, measure the noise, and change by 10%, and just constant fiddling around. And it's you know, better to just design so that you don't have this huge sensitivity. And so for advanced LIGO, all of the critical detectors have been put in the vacuum system. So hopefully, hopefully uh, no, no modern students will, will suffer what I suffered. Um, so this is the, the system I was talking about. The, the, what's shaking and amplifying by uh, this, this huge factor is this uh, blue pier and this brown vacuum chamber. There's some combined uh, uh, isolation, go, uh, shaking going on. And this is still a problem for the advanced LIGO. So whatever uh, seismic noise will be at the Indian site, it's going to be amplified by this system. And um, an interesting retrofit for the future is to figure out how to stabilize these things and reduce that extra amplification. Um, let's see. So I, yeah, I mentioned some of these things. Um, 
rubber. Yeah, Peter showed that there is rubber internal to the system, but um, because there are kind of coil springs, they need a, and they're, you know, it's a coil spring, and how do you match it to two horizontal surfaces? So little rubber seats were made to match the form factor of the spring to flat things like this. And uh, it turned out those rubber seats gave about as much damping as the fancy constrained layer stuff inside. Uh, but unfortunately, having so much rubber in the system meant that you opened up, you would do some work, and then you'd try to pump down the system, and slowly, 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 water would diffuse out of the rubber, and you would just keep pumping and pumping and pumping, and the partial pressure would just go down. The, it sounds like an annoying technical point, but the main thing is that you then become afraid of making any changes because every time you go in, you have to pump and pump and pump for weeks in order to operate the system again. And it's no way to live. So the, the key is not to have uh, the, the, something that can have so much water or contaminants in the system. Um, yeah, there were this low frequency amplification. Um, this was a problem. That this problem, I mean, it increased some low frequency noise, but the the kind of snowball effect is that this increase of needing more dynamic range at a low frequency left to basically redesign of everything. How we do the locking, hardware for doing the driving, how to do the sensing, you know, whole controls topologies were changed. We, we had this problem with uh, this Barkhausen noise effect, which is that uh, we have magnets glued on the optics in order to apply forces to them and we were applying so much force at low frequencies that the, some uh, domains in the magnets were flipping around and making some excess noise in the system because the basically magnetization of the magnets was not constant. Um, yeah, and on and on and on. So uh, I have this page of myths because th these kinds of things are often in the, I think they were in the initial literature maybe, and they, some. And I think it's important to look at these to make sure we don't believe them again. And, you know, it, I mean, of course, it's, it's a lot of su successes, but I think the interesting lessons come from what, what turned out to be surprising, right? Um, this is one of those things people would often say, well, this doesn't couple to that. And to more or less, everything couples to everything. That, I think that's the lesson of writing down these kind of matrices of linear systems. There's always something there, it's just a small number. And the, the question is, does it matter or not? And then we draw these curves that say it's quantum limited, it's thermal limited, but you saw that noise budget plot I showed you. It's really limited by something like 15 different things that are all on top of each other. Because of how humans operate, we just fix these things until it's not the biggest problem, but then eventually you get to the point where you have four or five problems which are all about equivalent you don't feel so motivated to fix either one of them because it won't make a big difference. You need to fix something like several things at once to make any impact. So that's what we ended up with. Um, it, I think the design was such that the thermal effects would not be uh, dominating or ruining the system. We now know that we, we basically live in the state where the uh, steady state thermal distortion of the optics is a a significant, I don't know about dominating, but it's, you, you, there's, there's no sort of argument where you can say, well, to first order something, something, something. It's to zeroth order, the thermal effects are there, and they influence the shape and, and the state of the, of the optics. And yes, commissioning takes a long time. It's, I think two years was the initial idea. Um, so this is, this is a picture of the, one of the end masses. You can see how big it is. And these are the, the wires. I don't know if you can see them, the wires that hold it. And Peter already showed you this picture of how the wire attaches to the suspension. Um, we had a lot of problems with the suspensions. Um, let's see. I don't know if, I don't think I, I want to go through all of these. But it's a lot of prehistory. But I, what, I think what you can get from this is there are a lot of issues, and uh, some of them were solved. Some of them, 
were just made to be not so bad, and then we we moved moved with uh, uh, moved on with life. Um, the shadow sensor issue that Peter mentioned, the, these little gold things here, um, these are the magnets. If you see these little white dots, and uh, in order to do the local feedback to keep the suspension cue low enough, we have a small shadow sensor in here. So when the magnet blocks an LED light, we sense there's a motion and apply some damping feedback. That's, that's the servo that Peter referred to. And uh, in the initial go around, uh, those shadow sensors operated at 980 nanometers and the main laser wavelength was 1064. So of course, if there was as soon as you would lock the cavity, there would be you know, a lot of circulating power. That light would shine around. You see all this shiny metal here. The light would bounce around and work its way into the shadow sensor. The shadow sensor would see this change in light power and then apply some force feedback. And so you have this spurious, completely unmodelable extra instability due to the fact that uh, you know, if you shake the mirror because the shadow sensor sees something, it changes the stored power. And anyway, you can imagine how nutty that would be. So we changed the wavelength, added some blocking, added some filtering, and it got better by uh, basically just good enough to uh, to make it workable. Yeah. Anyway, a lot of stuff. Optics. Um, our estimate of the surface mass optics was off because it had some systematics in it. Uh, we didn't, so therefore we didn't know how to model what was going on in the optics of the system. The initial setting point of some of the uh, optics was wrong, in the wrong position, and that sort of thing, which turned out to be good. We learned how to diagnose such things. Um, we, you know, several years into the project, had to add in uh, this adaptive optic system, which applies heat to the optics to correct the curvature. Um, but it was never a system designed to, you know, at a project level thing. It was basically a graduate students, you know, mid PhD project, which was taken, uh, not taken away from it, but more or less you can imagine, you know, some people ran in, took it from me being a PhD research project and tried to turn it into a device that you would use at a 24 7 observatory. And yeah, so it, it, that was a, a painful process. Five years together. Um, yeah, there's this very beautiful diagram that, that you've seen before of the length feedback. Um, and this is a this is a real dirty, dirty not secret, but dirty feature of how things ran. Um, at each port when we do this pound river hall detection, there's two quadrature phases, a cosine term and a and a sine term in phase and quadrature phase. And we've got uh, four degrees of freedom here, and we've got um, three photodetectors. So three photodetectors, six quadratures, four degrees of freedom. What do you do? You have a six, six sensors and four actuators. So we, we have four feedback loops. But then there were two uh, quadratures which were not controlled by any feedback. And in principle, if everything's perfect, they shouldn't have any signals on them. But in fact, both of them uh, had a, just a huge anomalous unsuppressed signal. And so we put so much light on here to get high signal to noise ratio for our real gravity wave signal. And the reason that works is we had strong high gain force feedback to keep this signal zeroed. So you increase the light until basically the photo detector is almost saturating and you apply a lot of feedback to keep it keep the signal from saturating the system. But if you don't have anything in the other one, then your detector just saturates itself and nothing works. And so we found that this thing was incredibly huge. It was, uh, in this phase, the signal was kind of fully modulating the beam. That and so on the fly, that electronic servo to just measure this quadrature and then apply our, you know, an RF electrical signal directly into the diode to cancel it out. So it means in our most sensitive place, we've got a real I, I think this is almost like a, a piece of uh, performance art.
But I, I'm talking about uh, like electronics problems and noise, upgrading. I'm now on the, the fourth microphone of this talk. This is the maximum number. Uh, okay, I I have nothing to, I have nothing to add besides this demonstration of, of noise and microphones, I guess. Um, okay. Um, so the last thing, basically, I, I, I keep harping on this angular controls problem. Uh, this is a picture of one of our angular sensors um, and, and some features of it. And this is the equivalent diagram. It's kind of the same kind of thing. There's modulation, demodulation, RF sensing, and feedback. Um, so we had uh, several problems uh, with it. These the the electronics were made. They were kind of noisy. The circuit layout was such that they were you know oscillating up at uh, 400 megahertz or someplace beyond the limit of the 300 megahertz scopes that we were using to look at it. So we didn't know what was happening. Um, yeah, so on and so on. So uh, so the sensing noise was something like. 10 to 100 times worse than what we needed for real operation. Um, luckily, we had a uh, older fellow around who knew electronics, so he he fixed these up after uh, after a year or so of work. Um, we had this problem that we we just didn't know how to understand we or we just didn't understand how to take the uh, very complicated sensing matrix that we had, which was you know this sort of mixed up degrees of freedom and sensing and how to apply feedback. Um, Matt Evans had the nice idea that uh, basically we should model how it should be, and then whenever there were dirty terms, we should just ignore them, and and hope for the magic of feedback to take take care of it. And that that finally worked. And, and after that, we were able to have stable alignment sensing. Um, yeah. Uh, let me skip through these things. Yeah, there were electronics problems, etc. I, I think this is a, another point that's important. Um, after the, we learned quite a bit of lessons in how to build the robust and low noise electronics for the system after many, many, many years of suffering. This is uh, Rich Abbott, one of our uh, main uh, electrical engineers, and. He's given me this list of good practices to use whenever, uh, yeah, yeah. And yeah, I won't read through them, but it's, it's worth you know it's worthwhile to to post this in the electronic shop, I think. And it seems it seems a kind of tedious point. Who cares about all these uh, electronics manufacturing things? But you other, you know, you you can defy these rules, but you'll you'll suffer. You'll suffer. And it, it takes a long time ahead of time to, to, to follow these things, but uh, you win in the end by not having to debug the same thing dozens and dozens of times. Is it not, not obvious? No up downs? Really? Huh. What is an up down? Um, it means. Uh, it doesn't mean it shouldn't say no up downs. It should say not so many up downs. Oh, uh, you detect your signal, and you should not attenuate the signal by a factor of 100, and then amplify it by 100, and then attenuate it by 100, and back and forth. The electronics are not linear in that sense. If you attenuate your signal at that stage, you're still the best you can do is you're, you'll be adding at least one nanovolt of noise to it because it's going to see the thermal noise of whatever that is. And then when you amplify it, you're amplifying that noise. And uh, for advanced LIGO, we've tried to do this thing called the 100 nanovolts rule, which is that at any point in the system, whenever a signal goes someplace else, we never try to ship a signal around where we're expecting it to have a noise floor less than 100 nanovolts per hertz, because it will pick up a reasonable amount of noise in the cabling and acoustics and so on. So we we have some up downs, but not many. So uh, the, I don't know. The, these are my 
these are my feelings about what uh, these are some tough tough things to, in, to to have enough discipline to do ahead of time but they I think they really pay off in a, in a big way it's not a small effect uh, even even if the design is wonderful you know advanced LIGO will be wonderful advanced Virgo Kagra everything is wonderful but if it's slightly less than wonderful there ought to be some backup plan and it's not to say that we have a we we don't have faith in the in the design that we've done but uh, there are some places where we know that it's you know it's it's less well known than others and and for those it's very wise to have some backup and so to be doing R&D for the next generation interferometers is always very good and this not 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 necessarily every piece will be useful right away but if you have several things going then you're going to be very well placed to put in some sort of patch if you need it to get by um, we've always had trouble with the modeling and simulation in the system which is we have models of some systems but um, very often we discover things and while doing the experiment where we then say oh yeah we could have calculated this by just doing such and such and such and it's not exhaustive it's not needing a finite element full-time domain high frequency low frequency you know it's not all details put into one that, that's a model that's unworkable but it's one where based on experience we make one which has just the right amount of details and there we could have 10 times more people working on simulation and not and not be not have too many I think um, this this I think is, is going well now um, we have uh, the number of grad students involved in the interferometer debugging is uh, something uh, I would say five maybe five to seven times more than before and it it makes it uh, it's a little crowded sometimes you know who gets what how much time to do this but um, these these are the people who will be you know ten years from now uh, taking over and running the third and fourth and fifth generation instruments so might as well get as many in as, as you can and it's it's also very annoying to have have to build in these diagnostics into your system but um, we I think we we really lucked out in that uh, people really spend a lot of time trying to f figure out how can we measure the noise at any place in the system and inject signals at any place in the system and with that we were able to do things like have this automatic noise budgeting and and so on and um, the yeah the interferometer which will, will come here will have that but it's uh, very likely that in the next few years we'll learn about several places where we'd like to have better diagnostics and so um, working on technologies like uh, how to have super fast um, analog to digital converters so we can look at you know in in the control room so we can look at the uh, high frequency laser noise or look for high frequency parametric instabilities and mechanical modes more and more diagnostics is better and if anyone has good ideas for um, diagnostics which are missing in the system right now um, now now is the time to develop them because in a few years we'll be we'll be happy that we have not so I this talk feels a little bit like I'm like I'm scolding somebody I don't know who I'm scolding I think I'm just I'm I'm talking to myself in the past saying you should have done better so that's uh, that's the only person who's being blamed but anyway that that's that's what I remember from that
what really happens <coughs> unless you see gravity as a force acting on the mirrors. Conceptuality is not easy to understand what happens. Is that uh, yes. okay with everybody in the mainly in the collaboration or some people have doubts? Uh, it's even worse than that though. Uh, the optics are connected by the optical laser optical spring. So yes, that's okay, that's also the idea. Yeah, if you remove the, the force feedback you have the fact that this optical feedback is suppressing the gravitational signal. So it's not free. Yeah, so uh, is there a discussion on this or people are happy with it? There, just like this, there's some discussions. Usually, uh, after some few beers, we say, well, what about this non-free non entrances? And then some, ah, quiet down. Stop rocking the boat. Let's pretend it's free. Yeah, there, uh, I, I, I mentioned this a few times, I think. Um, this, this, the thing about feedback, of course, but there, there is this uh, paper about feedback by this guy, Warwick, Warwick, Warwick Bowman. I think it's nice. I think 2012, maybe 2013, um, he wrote this in, in response to people who were um, worrying about nanomechanical force sensing. They were saying, um, if you, you know, if you have a mechanical oscillator at the ground state, what are you really sensitive to? And he was trying to point out that uh, you cannot consider yourself to be at the ground state if you just got to the ground state by applying electronic feedback. That this application of feedback or not doesn't change in any way your linear sensitivity. And um, you, can, you can easily model your feedback system as just being a linear filter on the data stream. So as, lo as long as the feedback is linear, and so we're ignoring these nonlinear stuff I was talking about. As long as the feedback system is linear, you can get the same response by just taking the data stream, recording it, and putting it through some post-processing. And so it doesn't it doesn't change your sensitivity to external disturbance. True, if you see it as a force. What if you see it just as a space-time phase modulation? You're, you're saying in the TT gauge, there's some there's some problem. With, with I don't know whether there's a problem, but I'm just wondering whether at least people in the collaboration are agreeing on this and going ahead. Or there uh, are doubts. I, I don't think so. Not about not about feedback. I, I see it as whatever gauge it's in. The measurement that we get at the end is a, it's kind of independent of that. We get some light modulation signal, and our feedback system works to kind of high pass the signal, but it also high passes the noise by the same amount. So I I don't feel any I don't feel anything wrong about inverting the response of the feedback system after after recording the data. I don't feel like that's true true strain because in some sense one has made the interferometer rigid. Stuff space time is free to expand. Yes. <laughs> yeah. But we, we've made the interferometer rigid in a way that follows the space time. Because we are because we are measuring. So that's the only sense in which we are rigid. The suspension, I mean the forces we apply to suspensions are uh, I mean the crossover between pushing the suspension laser. We push the suspensions only up to about 7 hertz and then... No, no, I don't. At all frequencies we push the suspensions in the differential mode because the laser laser doesn't affect the differential link, the, the phase in the differential mode. But we push the laser with, to follow the common mode and we don't actually right. do anything in the differential. Right, in the differential mode we apply forces to the mirrors and that's with the up to, up to 200 hertz or so. Or we will. We did, and we will. But at the moment, we don't do anything because the, the escape valves are closed. I have a general question. 
what is the finish of the 4 km interferometer inside the liquid? The uh, finesse of the arm cavity? Uh, 4 km. 450. 4, 450. And what limits it? Oh, it's not limited. It was designed to be 450. Means we can we for, uh, take it further higher? Yes. So, uh, you're saying why not? How, why not? Uh, I'll tell you after lunch. It was very carefully chosen. We, we thought about anywhere from 200 to 2,000. And um, I wouldn't say it doesn't matter, um, but the details of 300 to 500 or something, it's not important because we compensate for the finesse by changing. I'll, I'll tell you after lunch because it's sure. it's in the detail of the signal extraction uh, capacity. Second question, can we uh, enhance the Detection by using a coherent signal amplification technique. I don't know what that means. Uh, for example, like just like in uh, the N Pro was amplified to the 180 level, what by just using an amplifier? No, no, we can't. Yeah, there's a there's a paper from uh, Carl Caves in the early 80s about um, basically noise noise limits and laser amplifiers and he discusses this idea of putting basically putting a laser at the dark board and amplifying it. Huh. And it's it's kind of the same thing that the, the best we can do is amplify the signal and the noise by the same amount. The, there, there's there's no amplifier which <coughs> is uh, noise reducing. And in reality they all have a little bit of noise. So in any amplification state will will spoil the thing. In general question, how exactly you inject signal in a science run? So they say you inject some template in a science run by uh, <coughs> giving some fluctuations to mirror. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, you see this blue wire at the top. Uh, the, the blue wire represents something like cable which goes from a computer through some circuit and then applies force to the mirror. No, so but the, the point is the same. So uh, it's like yeah, it's a, so it's like related to the previous question. So how that we can take an external thing to or how feedback cannot how uh, we just we add it to the feedback force. searches of data from years ago. There are people who are doing searches of data from now. People trying to improve 
improve the current detector on a kind of day-to-day -day basis or just doing maintenance. And then there are people doing really far out or some R&D for the five-year time scale, 10-year time scale, and um, there's always people even thinking about 50 years from now, what, what thinking do we need to do for that detector? There were, I can, you know, I was recently reminded that there's, in the, in the early 70s, the people working on relativity uh, wrote some papers on the idea of how will we test for deviations from general relativity using the waveforms of gravitational radiation. And they were thinking things like, once we have these detectors laid out, we'll have to consider the polarization of the fourth, you know, how the fourth detector might be oriented so that we can look for anomalous polarization in gravitation. So they were thinking something like 40 or 50. They didn't know it was that going to be that long, maybe, but the, the payoff of that thing was 40 or 50 years, or will, will be 40 or 50 years from when it was. So there's some tension, but I think there's there's room to relieve the tension by just choosing the time scale, which is makes you happy. So ICDS has agreed that uh, it can be done by filling in the form, filling in your bank details and scanning your ticket, uh, boarding passes also, invitation letter, and in the case of uh, lectures, the passport copies and the visa copies also. And you can mail it to the school account and uh, it will be paid online through directly to your bank account. Yeah? And uh, for the participants, it's also suggested that the form that you filled in, in uh, can be added with your uh, real tickets or the boarding passes and mailed to them also as an add-on copy. The mailing is just for the audit procedure. The payment will be done on the basis of the online scanned form submission that you do. Yeah, you can collect the forms from me. So you have the front which is essentially the TA form and the back for your bank details in which the payment will be done. Yeah. Uh, the hard copy, copy is only for the boarding passes and uh, this form just to make sure that they have if the audit asks for it. Otherwise, they're going to do go ahead with the payment with the online form. Uh, no, but the audit requires an original. That's the issue. Yeah. So they're not going to wait for the payment to be done till they get the original form. But the original form is useful to them if the audit objects to some extent and they can at least pick it out and say that yeah, here's the form which has been filled in original and here are the boarding passes and all things. We can break for lunch and be back at the experimental hall at two. And those guys who want to do finish, they can stay back with Professor Rana at the guest house itself and be here at around 4 for the coffee and then the subsequent. Let's break for lunch.